Every week, Hillsdale College President Larry P. Arn joins Hugh Hewitt to discuss great books, great men, and great ideas. This is the Hillsdale Dialogues, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. Also at the Hillsdale College Podcast Network, check out the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, the Larry P. Arn Show, and more, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. That music means it's time for the Hilldale Dialogue. Once a week, we go high and we go back far to founding principles and first principles. This week, Dean Matt Spaulding, head of the Hillsdale Graduate School of Statesmanship in Washington, D.C. at the Kirby Center, is joining us, but he's at the mothership today. Matt, good morning from Hillsdale. Is it snowing? It is not snowing, but given my luck, it'll start snowing very soon. Okay, you know, I, I'm I only invited there in often. January. So I, I've never seen Hillsdale when it's not covered with snow, but I, I'm glad you're there and it's not snowing. Fall must be beautiful at Hillsdale, actually. How often do you go out to the mothership? Um, it depends. I, I, yeah, I zoom out there quite often, but I probably get out here once a month. So it's pretty, pretty often. And sometimes the next day I'll go out for meetings. We're busy folks. You know, there's a lot to be done here. Do you it's fly to Detroit safe. or to Grand Rapids when you do that? I usually go into Detroit and drive from there. What do you What do you prefer? I go to Detroit. Last week I was supposed to go to my forty fifth uh, my fortieth law school reunion. I didn't go because the Lions had beaten the Chiefs, and I were afraid everyone was drunk at Detroit Airport for the whole weekend. So I didn't go. Matt Spaulding, I want to begin yeah. with uh, with the low and end at the high. This is the low point of this week. Uh-huh. Merrick Garland testifying before. The House Judiciary Committee with Jim Jordan, cut number 19. Let's play it for Dean Spaulding. Quote, Mr. Weiss has full authority to bring cases in other jurisdictions if he feels it's necessary. That was your response, Attorney General, to Senator Grassley's question on March 1st, 2023. You just referenced it when Mr. Bishop was questioning you. Only problem is he'd already been turned down by the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia, Mr. Graves. So he didn't have full authority, did he? I had an extended conversation with uh, Senator Grassley at the time. We briefly touched on the Section 515 question and how that process went. Um, I've My never been suggested. Simple. My point's real simple, Mr. Garland. You said he had complete authority, but he'd already been turned down. He, he wanted be- to bring an action in the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Attorney there said, no, you can't. And then you go tell the United States Senate under oath that he has complete authority. I'm going to say again that uh, no one had the authority to turn him down. They could refuse uh, to partner with him. They could you not. You can use whatever you, you, language. They- refuse to partner is turning down. Well, it's not the same under a well-known Justice Department practice. Here, here's why this... So, uh, Matt Spaulding, how do you react to that exchange? Uh, well, I, I was struck by the whole, the whole um, uh, testimony and, and the back and forth. It, it had everything to do with a lot of confusion. It seemed to be have several points of contradiction. Uh, the main point one here, I think there's a deep confusion about exactly what is a special counsel, what, what is going on, who's their authority, who do they report to and how this fits in within the constitutional system. And my broad comment, and I want to come back to the particular one here, it strikes me that what we're seeing, and this this testimony is a great example of this, is what happens when you have the kind of the, the, the continuing, the beginning of the breakdown of the rule of law, how does that actually play, play out in our constitutional politics? This strikes me as an example where the, the uh, attorney general is... Um, uh, working with someone who is actually under his authority and seeming to give them, uh, one, on the one hand, wanting to give them complete independence as if they're an independent prosecutor, um, which, of course, uh, there's a backstory in that we can discuss, when in actuality he's a special prosecutor, which is say he's under the Justice Department and he's he works for the Justice Department. Um, the, the whole thing strikes me is full of confusions and contradictions, and shows you how the, the, the rule of law, which used to be uh, uh, falling under a, uh, an executive authority, uh, constitutional authority, separate from the lawmaking authority, 
um, how that has now become very confused in a modern situation where uh, increasingly judicial uh, uh, prosecutions are handled administratively under the guise of the, the executive uh, to serve purposes that don't seem to be on their face publicly constitutional purposes. Uh, now, so Dean I, Spalding, I found it uh, very deeply disturbing. This is a 50-year-old yeah. controversy. It goes back to October of 1973, when then-President Richard Nixon ordered then-Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire then-Special Counsel Archibald Cox over Cox's Archibald demand Cox. for the president's tapes. Elliot Richardson refused and resigned, a perfectly appropriate response. Williams Ruckel's house refused and resigned, a perfectly appropriate response. Robert Bork said, I will do it, fired Cox, and the Senate came back and said, we will not confirm anybody unless and until you give us a promise, President Nixon, that you won't fire the next special counsel. A perfectly appropriate response. It has metastasized since that, but the original proposition was there is a unitary executive. And I think That's people right. in the and, country and, have forgotten that. Well, th think about how those uh, those episodes you just went through very, very nicely. What did that reflect? Which is say that the, the dilemma, uh, uh, the great constitutional dilemma here is what happens when the branch of government uh, with the power of prosecuting and executing the law is investigating essentially itself. Uh, there are all sorts of potential conflicts of interests and problems. And one way you solve that problem, the, the best way to solve problem in the, in the sense of a constitutional government is to have a check on it by the, by the Congress. But in order for that to make any sense, for, the, for the, 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 the separation of powers to make any sense in a constitutional system, those powers have to be given to one branch and stay within one branch. You can't have things occurring outside of the, uh, uh, the executive branch, just as you can't have lawmaking occurring outside of the legislative branch. So uh, I, I think, you know, and then the shift away from uh, that situation to get around that, they created a, a, a independent um, uh, council, and that turned out to be a disaster as well. And now we're getting back to this special council, but I think the attorney general wants to have it both ways. He wants to um, uh, run the council's office as if it reports to him and uh, they're seemingly to use it, or they, this is the question to be investigated. They're, they seem to be using it for purposes having to do with uh, their own political interests. Um, uh, and to do that, he's saying it's, it's independent. If you recall in the testimony, he said, I don't report to anybody. I don't report to the president uh, himself, the attorney general. Um, and yet at the same time, in doing so, he's kind of breaking down the line of authority that actually has been well established uh, between the president who has that uh, uh, authority through the Constitution delegated then to the attorney general delegated down to his, uh, to his counsel. Now, Matt Spaulding, not only do we lose the line of authority from the president, the attorney general, to everybody who works at the Department of Justice, we now have state right. prosecutors stepping into federal matters, both in Manhattan and Atlanta. This is an invitation to chaos. And that which gets rewarded gets repeated, right? These two federal, these two state prosecutors are getting the praise of legacy media. What do you anticipate being the complication here? And do you think this is constitutional, what they are doing at the state and county level to former President Trump? Well, I mean, I mean look, the, the, um, I, I, I am right now teaching my course on the, the, um, for, the, for our graduate school on the, the, on the founding and the establishment of constitutional law under the United States Constitution. In order to do so, I go back and start with Magna Carta and spend a lot of time on British history going through the Civil Wars um, and the Jameses and the Charleses up to the Glorious Revolution and the groundwork that lays. We sometimes forget the importance of um, the, the politics that went through uh, England in order to give rise to the establishment of the rule of law, to due process. Uh, the problem in English history was the extent to which it was becoming arbitrary and it was uh, essentially out of control, largely up through and controlled by the king. Uh, that gave rise to the rule of law in the first place. I think in, in many ways we're seeing a certain 
uh, reverse of uh, the, what is probably the most revolutionary process in, in American history, which is established constitutional government under the rule of law. Uh, and now we're seemingly go back and we're going back in the other direction, uh, which is to say the, uh, the executive, uh, the president's office, um, uh, through the attorney general, is acting like a unitary uh, executive, meaning they're claiming the powers of, uh, of all the executive powers wherever they possibly could have them. But they seem to be doing it in a way that is arbitrary and political. And now spin that off into uh, these these state prosecutors. In some sense, it's the same thing. Uh, these seem to be politically motivated, which is to say they're happening for reasons outside of the normal rule of law and outside the process for which someone is due. That's a serious, serious problem. When we come back from break, we're going to talk about the English Civil War and how one ought to approach constitutional history. Matt Spalding, not surprisingly, does it the right way. And that's the way I do it as well, which is you've got to go way back to get to the present. Stay tuned, America. The Hillsdale Dialogue rolls along right after these words. Stay tuned. Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I've got a challenge for you today. Become a better educated American citizen. And to help you do just that, we at Hillsdale College have our free online courses available for all who wish to learn. Our challenge? Take just one of our courses. There are so many to choose from, you can discover the beauty of the Bible in the Genesis story, study the writings of C.S. Lewis, or explore the true meaning of America in Constitution 101. We have dozens more to choose from, and all these self-paced free courses feature Hillsdale faculty and scholars, many you've heard on this podcast. So visit hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, and pick one of the more than 30 free Hillsdale courses. I hope you'll accept my challenge. Pick whichever course you like and become a more educated citizen today. Go to hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Welcome back, America. The Hillsdale Dialogue completes our week on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Every single week, all things Hillsdale are found at hillsdale.edu. You can find all the Hillsdale Dialogues going back a decade now at hillsdale.edu. You can also find all the online video courses that are available free, and you can sign up to receive Imprimus in your mailbox, the old-fashioned way, a key speech digest available to subscribers for free if you visit hillsdale.edu and find the box for Imprimus. Dean Matt Spalding helms the graduate school on the study of statesmanship at Hillsdale, centered at the Kirby Center in Washington, D.C. But he does teach a class, and he's teaching it this week on campus uh, at Hillsdale. Matt, I've been teaching con law for 25 years. I've given the same lecture on con law one and con law two in the first substantive lecture Hi. every year, which is you must learn the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Brits if you want to understand the American founding. Uh, I, I, it seems to me like you adopt the same approach. Would you explain to people, people have heard me explain why I do it that way. Why do you insist at least on understanding English history before we get to American history? Well, uh, you know, absolutely. And in some extent, you have to, you really have to go back as far as you did as well. It's very important for us to understand the, 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 the slow and steady rise of constitutional government and the rule of law. Uh, it happens over time. It does uh, go back to the Greeks and the Romans, especially. Uh, I think it also has something to do with the rise of Christianity, which is a, a the, the initial establishment of equality before God. But having said that, it goes through British history. We are the inheritors of the, the, the greatest um, uh, uh, rise of constitutional government and the rule of law in, in history. You, you must understand that. Uh, and I'm increasingly struck, and I spend more and more time every time I teach it about English history. When you read the American Constitution and you read the Declaration of Independence, for that matter, it makes um, much more sense, indeed is much more powerful, if you understand the terms they're using, such as due process uh, and equality before the law, um, but also if you understand the context in which they are writing. You, you, you have to understand that the um, uh, England, especially after the uh, Reformation, and you start having questions about religion and politics, this causes a, a great 
uh, controversy in the West about how to maintain this, this rising idea about the rule of law. Uh, and increasingly what that leads to is a uh, more and more powerful king who uh, calls more and more of this onto themselves, especially once you get into the Stuart kings, uh, James I, Charles I, um, and it's all wrapped up together. So if you understand, you understand the, the rise of due process, uh, which was already kind of taking place in England, coming out of Magna Carta, but, but then was uh, being threatened uh, with the rise of uh, more, um, uh, the, the stronger uh, Tudor kings, and especially the Stuart kings who are pulling it on themselves, as opposed to the increasing rise of parliament, which comes into being at this time, and the, and the legislative power, uh, that battle was going on for for you know some some quite a bit of time in England. It comes to a head under the Stuart kings, which is a battle not only over religion in England, but uh, but in many ways uh, more broadly over the role of the executive, the king versus parliament, the rule of law. Uh, the common law develops during this time. Uh, parliament itself comes, develops, um, and uh, that fight becomes the fights which become the, the civil wars in England, of which there are, depending on how you count them, uh, at least three or four, uh, one of which causes the king to lose his head, Charles I. Uh, another causes uh, his son to flee and, and is replaced in a coup. You know, and to get out of that problem, uh, the Americans had to rethink all this again. Uh, I teach my students that coming out of the American, uh, excuse me, coming out of the English uh, controversies, the civil wars, in which you, the way you replace an executive is cut off their head, uh, they had several options to look at. One was uh, Hobbes' Leviathan, which is written about that same time, uh, uh, anticipating a restoration of the kingship in the form of a Leviathan. Uh, you had uh, Filmer, who writes a book called Patriarchia, about uh, the divine uh, right of kingship. Um, and then the other example they had before them was Oliver Cromwell, during the brief period between the kings, before the restoration, uh, there was a brief uh, time where they got rid of the monarchy. Unfortunately, they, they replaced it with a theocracy, which was almost as, as bad. Um, those are the options they faced. And instead, what did they do? They followed the Whig argument during the Glorious Revolution, which was, was the end of the, the Civil Wars. Uh, which was an increasing push towards parliamentary or legislative authority based on consent and a, a strong attempt to restrict the king uh, through the rule of law. But England could not do that with a monarch. They could not make the leap, if you will. The leap happens when the Americans write a written constitution and put the, uh, the rule of law in the centerpiece of it, due process, under the United States Constitution. That's the, 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 the broad American revolution. When we come back, that I'm going to pick up there, man. On, the, um, yeah. the book I keep handy for this is Andrew Roberts, The Last <laughs> King of America. And I love this because people forget America had a king. And we dumped him. <laughs> and we dumped him because the Brits showed us how, and we improved upon their precedent. Don't go anywhere. Matt Spaulding will be right back. In the meantime, go to hillsdale.edu. Sign up for Imprimus. Sign up for one of their courses on the Constitution or all of our dialogue. I mean, that's the only podcast you need is the Hillsdale Dialogue. You'll be a much smarter person if you just start at the beginning and come up to the present. That's 10 years worth. Stay tuned. I'm you doing. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. The breakdown of the rule of law occurs when the constitutional structure is simply put aside and avoided. Yesterday, President Biden announced unilaterally in the Oval that they were sending more billions of dollars of aid to Ukraine. Now, I support aid to Ukraine, but the ability of the president to do that unilaterally, uh, Matt Spaulding, dean of the Hillsdale Graduate School and all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu, you're listening to the Hillsdale Dialogue. The ability of the president to do things unilaterally like that is sometimes there, depending on the language of the appropriations bill, but they're stretching it to the breaking point. How much of the opposition to Ukrainian aid that is growing among Republicans do you attribute to the cause itself, and how much do you attribute to the fact that the president is acting unilaterally and extra-constitutionally? No, I, I think it's it's both, and I'm actually interested in your opinion on this as well. 
it seems to me that we have a, um, a, a kind of several different controversies going on right now. Um, and I, I think that uh, in, in a period where you have, say, you know, narrow majorities in the House, they're trying to get uh, better control of their process and their budgetary authorities, which they do their constitutional duties. Um, it's, it, but they're doing it at a time when over the last number of decades, more and more of their authority they have previously ceded to the executive branch. And the executive now has massive amounts of authority, uh, which gives them increasing amounts of discretion. Indeed, I think there are many cases in which that discretion clearly isn't there. You cited the Ukraine example. We could talk about uh, forgiving student loans without congressional authority. Some of them are, are more blatant than others. But there are many cases in which the executive could, through some shadow of penumbras in the laws, uh, make an argument by putting together pieces here and there that they have the authority to do something. This They could have a, a kind of a shade of an argument. And again, I, I would put this in the context of my earlier comments about what this is what starts happening when you have when you have departed from a constitutional structure which has a clear division of powers uh, and the lawmaking power is separate, especially from the executive power. Right. This goes back to the battles of the English Civil Wars the, between the executive and the legislature. When you start melding those two things together, the executive will have a natural advantage because they have, um, they can essentially broadly read uh, through uh, very uh, poorly written laws to find authorities they, they want, um, and then they can, they can execute. And once they start doing that, once they start uh, following that pattern, it gets easier and easier to do that. Emergency powers, foreign policy powers, uh, especially. So I think this is all very uh, disturbing, but it's also very part and parcel. The, the, what we talked about with, with, with Garland and the special counsel, uh, these actions where the president independently is essentially spending, spending monies without congressional authority, uh, the extent to which uh, Congress has seems to be, especially in the last uh, you know, day or so, increasingly unable to uh, f fulfill its, uh, its budgetary responsibilities and said is kind of... Uh, uh, unable to to it do its constitutional powers. There is a broad breakdown here, which I think we should be extremely concerned about. Now, I, I also want to make sure people, this is not a partisan point. All presidents alike. Donald Trump reprogrammed Department of Defense money to build the wall because Congress wouldn't give him the wall. So when we object to Donald Trump unilaterally spending on Ukraine, if he reprograms, I know what the Democrats are going to say. They're going to say, Donald Trump did that. So either one stands on the Constitution or one doesn't. Now, I want to go back to 1688. When we talk about the glorious revolution, if, if you can expand on it, Matt, I teach my con law students that the colonists, when they began the agitation in the 1760s, were as far removed from the glorious revolution as we are from World War II. I mean, we know it. Our fathers knew it. Right. Our, our, our mothers and brothers and sisters and everyone grew up reading about it. We watch movies about it. The glorious revolution was deeply imprinted on the colonists. And they knew that the legislature did not represent them. The king did. And didn't they try and keep the king out of it at first because they were willing to accept the king, but they weren't willing to accept taxation? The colonists, I mean. Uh, all that is is true. I make a general point first about your uh, your reference to their understanding of history. Um, I, I've read and I teach the, uh, the Madison's notes at the Constitutional Convention. I would say two thirds of the time at the Constitutional Convention, they're arguing about history. Oh, which say they're arguing about British history because that's their history. They knew that intimately when they made references to the Revolution in the 1760s. They're not talking about the American Revolution. They're talking about the Glorious Revolution. So it was deeply embedded in 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 in, in all of their in all of their thinking. Um, I think one of the things it's interesting here is how uh, in in England and in America we took different lessons from the Glorious Revolution. In England, after the Glorious Revolution, they had a new kind of unified argument, which was the King in Parliament. Uh, this is the class current made by Blackstone. There's one sovereign and it's the king and parliament acting together with a nod towards parliamentary power. Uh, the Americans took a, a different lesson from the Glorious Revolution. I think they took the right lesson from the Glorious Revolution. 
which was that it's a hard check against executive power. Uh, and that has to be thought through in the context of a written constitution. Uh, but more importantly, they understood the argument to the glorious revolution, underlying argument, and the shift towards legislative power to be a legislative power based on actual consent. This is you get from Algernon Sidney and, and uh, John Locke that the Americans uh, accepted that political argument, which is it can only be based on consent, so it has to be actual consent. So if the Americans in the 1760s, they still accepted the authority of the king because they had their charters with the king and the king protected them. But they insisted upon, uh, rightly, that their legislatures, their local legislatures, where actual consent occurred, would be the ones that would tax ourselves. This is why the American Revolution begins with a tax revolt, because Parliament is trying to tax them without their consent. But it, it, it goes back to this fundamental break, which is the whole history of constitutional law, well, well before uh, you know, uh, the English uh, Civil Wars. How do you make law? Is it merely the arbitrary decisions of the king, uh, of one person and his lords? Or is it this process which is slowly developing in England that it should be this house of individuals, this house of commons, this meeting called a parliament? Uh, but they couldn't make the leap, as I said earlier. The Americans, I think, got the lesson right. They developed that argument of consent. Consent has to be grounded philosophically in equality, equality before the law, equality before God, that all men are created equal in the Declaration. And that plays out so that by the time you get to 1776, or the last king, George III, uh, is no longer protecting them. Why? Because he's actually not an independent sovereign anymore. He's, he's at the behest of parliament, and he must follow their rule. And their I, rule I want to, uh, we made a cardinal order. rule, uh, a cardinal, a, a category error. We've assumed that the Steelers fans know what the Glorious Revolution is. So let's pause for a moment. In 1688... James II has become the king. He is the son of the beheaded, the second son of the beheaded Charles. Charles the II has died, and James II comes right. along, and he's going to take them back to becoming Catholic. And Marlborough leads the coup d'etat that you talk about. It's a bloodless coup. They just send James II off in a rather deft change out. But it is that revolution, the ability to change leadership, that I think drives deep. But it comes after a hundred years, not quite a hundred years, but decades of bloody religious conflict. It also explains the American right. approach to religion, Matt Spaulding. We want none of that Absolutely. in the United States. And when I hear the left talking about Christian nationalism, the last thing originalists want is anyone, any kind of theological argument running government. Though people who hold theological positions are, of course, welcome in the government they may not advance that as the law uh, outside of reference to actual law. No, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that's why this whole history is also the history of the rise and establishment of religious freedom. Uh, remember, the best thing you got in England through those same civil wars that developed into the Glorious Revolution, in, including after the Glorious Revolution in England, the best thing you got was religious tolerance. Uh, and tolerance is a limited, <laughs> a limited quality because in England, the king is still the head of the church. Um, again, the, they couldn't make the break to the next step, which was that no, religious liberty is a matter not of toleration, but a matter of right. Um, and both these arguments, the argument of religious um, uh, liberty, the argument of consent, which is coming through the development of the rule of law, um, they have the same root. They have the same um, deep-rooted argument where the Americans both look back to the Romans, the Greeks, in an older argument, uh, which has had a touchstone in Magna Carta, and then they looked ahead and reestablished it. And, and, and so in that sense, the American Revolution already was a restoration. And they're restoring an argument that in the very nature of things, in the very nature of being a human being, uh, you are fundamentally equal. You're equal before the law. You're equal in the eyes of God. Christianity really introduces a radical understanding of equality. And the only way to do that, the only way to do that justly, which does not lead to chaos, which does not lead to arbitrary government on behalf of the king, 
which is not uh, star chambers in which the king tries to uh, go after his political enemies. The only way to do that is through constitutional government, not merely a parliament separated from the king, but a whole structure of a separate executive, a separate legislature, and eventually a separate judiciary. When we come back, we're going to finish by talking about whether this argument resonates in American political debate today in Iowa, New Hampshire, and beyond. Don't go anywhere. Matt Spaulding will be back. The Hillsdale Dialogues continue. All the Hillsdale Dialogues are found at hillsdale.edu, and you can also sign up for Imprimus there. I'll be right back with Matt Spaulding. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an 8 to 1 student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Welcome back, America. I always finish the Hillsdale Dialogue by asking my guest this week, Dean Matt Spaulding, who helms the Graduate School on Statesmanship for Hillsdale in the Kirby Center in Washington, D.C., all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Can we connect what we've been talking about, the big issues that go all the way back to the English Civil Wars and before that, actually, to Roman, Greek, and Jewish history? Can we connect that to the politics of 2024? And can candidates make arguments that resonate based on these... Uh, propositions, Matt Spaulding. What do you think, Dean? I, I, I think they can. I think this is actually at the heart of our politics. And I think most people understand what is going on. I think what they need are clear political voices, meaning meaning good voices in the political square, who can explain these things uh, to them. I think there's a, a, a deep sense, whether you like Trump or not, um, that that are 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 judicial uh, rule of law process, the judicial process itself has become intermixed with politics in a way that makes us very uncomfortable. And we see something unjust and unfair about that. And we need to start thinking through about how we kind of separate those, those, those things out. Everybody is equal before the law, as we, as, we, as we all like to say, no one is above the law, but that means everyone also gets due process of law. And so I think there's a great injustice occurring there. But I, I think people are starting to see. And what I fear about is the extent to which the rule of law itself is becoming uh, becoming politics, part of our normal political process. And I, I think they can see and understand that. Yeah, Matt, what, we've what, never what seen this, this before. Was a hard we, we've part. never seen before. President Joe Biden, go back to the unitary executive we talked about, yeah. is prosecuting his former and future rival, Joe, uh, uh, Donald Trump. We have never Donald seen Trump. this before. How significant is that? Because that's the big picture. A president is prosecuting his rival. No, that's absolutely right. And that is hugely significant. And that's what gives me the, the, the pause about thinking about the English Civil Wars. I mean, the, the, the whole constitutional system is, is to prevent uh, those with power without unjustly using it in particular against their political enemies to extend their power. That's why you have checks and balances. Uh, so this deep sense of, of, of injustice that I think most people see needs to be pointed back to the reestablishment of the constitutional rule of law and checks and balances. Look, the separation of powers and all this stuff that, are, that good constitutional lawyers like us like, us like to talk about is not the sexiest of topics, but as a practical matter, that's what it's all about. The Constitution is a framework to set up so that they argue with each other, but they check each other and prevent them from crossing these lines. The breakdown of the rule of law now prevents means there's no check. Why Garland's uh, testimony was so revealing was that it shows patently that, um, uh, that this is a political prosecution. And then when you see other people not being prosecuted, uh, the president's son uh, or whatever it might be, or, or some of these other cases that are coming up, 
it will remind you of the rule of law, as John Adams said, uh, rather than the rule of law, we are seeing the rule of men and the rule of men have self-interest and they have political instincts and that's where they naturally go because we are all fallen human beings. That's why you need constitutional government. It's not a complicated legalistic uh, Supreme Court argument. It's a basic common sense argument about how we live together and, and rule and rule in turn and live under self-government. This is, by the way, why I think whatever Jack Smith gets in terms of conviction or acquittal in the District of Columbia, I believe the Supreme Court will throw those charges out for this very reason. That same reason they threw out the Bob McDonald charges brought by the same man, Jack Smith. It is a breach of our fundamental understanding of how we govern ourselves. Do you agree with my prediction, Matt? Uh, absolutely. I think you're right. But the problem is that in the meantime, in the public debate, there is a uh, assault on the, on the rule of law itself because we, we are doing these things which teach people, again, how to think about politics around them. And we increasingly see politics getting into the rule of law. And I think that is actually a, a, a problem as well. As, I think this plays out well in, in, in the long run in terms of things being thrown out. But, but in the meantime, um, it's, I, I think, become a, a deeper and deeper problem going to the very core of how our modern government actually operates. Oh, the disaster will um, be, here's the, the disaster, Dean Spaulding. Donald Trump loses narrowly after having been convicted on one or more, and those convictions are overturned by the Supreme Court meaning that the loss was illegitimate. That's the disaster. And that's what Jack Smith... That, that is the disaster. That, and on that happy You're note... You're absolutely we, right. It's, it's hard to on that happy note, we conclude this week's Hillsdale Dialogue. Matt Spaulding, <laughs> thank you for putting on your tie early this morning at Hillsdale. Go out and shovel the snow. We're not going to lie to you. It's snow. It's not okay. snowing in Michigan. I'm, t- I'm telling you, Fib. Uh, good to see you, Matt Spaulding. All things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Great seeing you. Sign up for Imprimus at hillsdale.edu. Got, watch the video. Of course, they're all free. It's all free. It's an attempt to educate the American public about the founding and how it matters today and will continue to matter tomorrow and throughout 2024 and beyond. Thanks for listening to the Hillsdale Dialogues, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. For more information about Hillsdale College, head to hillsdale.edu.